On October 20th, 1947, a congressional committee began hearings on un-American activities in the movie industry. People with unpopular political opinions were accused of subversion and lost their jobs. They were blacklisted. From Hollywood, the blacklist spread to businesses and universities, institutions and communities across the country. Thousands became the targets of denunciations, suspicion, and fear. This is the story of one man and his family and their life under the blacklist for 15 years. Nobody did anything wrong. That was what made it so crazy. Nobody was trying to overthrow the government. It was a lot of hokum. But how do you explain that to a child? Jim was six. You were only three, Tony. How the hell is a child gonna understand anything like that? Blacklisted, episode one, Hollywood on trial. It's hard to remember exactly. I was only three, but I seem to have the same dream every night. I'm in our big home in Beverly Hills, running for my life down the long and ringing halls. A monster is chasing me. I reach a door and throw it open. Behind it is a friend. He smiles and his eyes go dead. He's not my friend, but the monster. I turn and run to another door. My friend is behind it, and again his eyes go dead, and again I flee in horror, terrified of everything I trust, praying to wake up soon or die. It turns out I was dreaming the truth. Calling the House Un-American Activities Committee to order, Chairman J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey opens an inquiry into possible communist penetration of the Hollywood film industry. The committee is seeking to determine if Red Party members... 3,000 miles away in Washington, D.C., on October 20th, 1947, J. Parnell Thomas, chairman of the House Un-American Activities Committee, had opened public hearings into communist infiltration of the motion picture industry. That communists have made such an attempt in Hollywood and with considerable success is already evident to this committee from its preliminary investigative work. We want to know what strategic positions in the industry have been captured by these elements whose loyalty is pledged in word and deed to the interests of a foreign power. All we are after are the facts. A long list of prominent motion picture witnesses appear before the committee. The committee had subpoenaed 19 Hollywood screen artists, identified by the FBI as suspected members of the Communist Party. One of them was a screenwriter, my father, Gordon Kahn. Kahn is a subscriber to the Daily Worker and seems to follow the Moscow Party line. And Kahn personally remarked to me that he had no objection to living next door to Negroes, Japanese... Mr. Renner. and Mrs. Gordon Kahn belong to the Russian-American Club. Dear Mr. Hoover, I agree with you that now is the time for every American to stand up and be counted. And I thought you should know the score... J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, had had my father under surveillance for over three years as an organizer of the Screenwriters Guild, a supporter of labor unions and civil rights, and a longtime opponent of the House and American Activities Committee. Much of Hoover's information was hearsay from my father's neighbors, co-workers, and acquaintances. By October 1947, the file was nearly a thousand pages long. I'm convinced he's definitely a communist, though I have no proof of card membership. He does not believe in capitalism, although he has numerous financial holdings and investments. The 19 had flown to Washington two weeks before the start of the hearings to plan their strategy and defense. One of Hoover's agents was at the airport with a camera. Hey, here. In the picture, with his monocle and goatee, my father looks more like a count than a commissar, observing the cheering crowd with amusement and reserve. This way to the flying tumbler. <laughs> Leave it to go. One of his colleagues told me that a moment later, as he stepped aboard, he christened the plane the Flying Tumbrel, after the carts that had carried victims of the French Revolution to the guillotine. Oh, you people 
standing up, please sit down, and the photographers, please come over. The committee had announced that it would begin its first week of questioning with the so-called unfriendly 19. Given the enormous press turnout from all over the nation, it decided to open with friendly witnesses instead. I would suggest that the Congress of the United States immediately enact such legislation as will preserve the Bill of Rights to the people for whom it was designed. That precious bill was never intended to protect enemy agents, saboteurs, and spies, whether they're American or alien-born. I favor the outlawing of the Communist Party as a, an agency of a foreign government. They heard from anti-communist stars like Robert Taylor and Gary Cooper, and from studio heads like Louis B. Mayer of MGM and Jack Warner of Warner Brothers. Our American way of life is under attack from without and from within our national borders. I believe it is the duty of each loyal American to resist those attacks and defeat them. They heard from J. Edgar Hoover. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. And before the day was out, they heard about Gordon Kahn. The final witness for the day was Maury Riskin, a Hollywood musical comedy writer and Pulitzer Prize winner. Riskin is a master of the gag line. You know Mr. Gordon Kahn? I do. We don't agree politically. Mr. Kahn happens to be a neighbor of mine. In fact, he bought the uh, house next door to me. We don't talk, but uh, he's very pleasant to my children. I'm pleasant to his. My dog's a very good friend. <laughs> This will not increase neighborly relations, but that is my opinion. October 20, 1947. Well, sweets, the fireworks began today, and who should be the very first writer mentioned but your own precious Gordon, right out of the box. That first night from the Shoreham Hotel in Washington, my father wrote my mother back home in Los Angeles. Our neighbor, Maury Riskin, was sitting right behind me in the hearing room. I asked him if my house was still there, at least, and he said, uh, honest, I didn't bomb it. The hotel here is a hive of excitement. There's always something to do, and I'm not getting to bed until 2 and 3 a.m. We had a very successful meeting tonight with about 1,400 people, 400 of them standees. The real aim of the committee is to control the content of motion pictures from censorship and political intimidation, to sow fear of blacklists, to destroy democratic guilds and unions by interference in their internal affairs. This committee is waging a cold war on democracy. My father never told me if he joined the Communist Party. I assumed that like thousands of progressive Americans in the 1930s, he did. But he challenged the right of anyone to make it a matter of public record, or a measure of his ability to hold a job. Forty liberal stars called the Committee for the First Amendment agreed, and flew to Washington from Hollywood at the end of the first week to lobby against the committee. They included Danny Kaye, Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Judy, Judy Garland. Garland. Okay, there it is. We've heard from Hollywood, New York, and Washington. Now it's time to hear from you. If you agree with us, if you feel there is something going on here that would make Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, and Wendell Wilkie fighting mad, please do something about it. This investigation hit us in show business pretty close to home. We're doing something about it right now. Before every free conscience in America is subpoenaed, please speak up. Say your piece. Write your congressman a letter. Airmail special. Let Congress know what you think of its un-American committee. Tell them how much you resent the way Mr. Thomas is kicking the living daylights out of the Bill of Rights. I asked you, when they put words in concentration camps, how long will it be before they put men there, too? Privately, the studio heads resented the committee's interference, too. Some of the 19 were among the most talented and highly paid in the industry. 
Dear Barbara, Eric Johnston of the Motion Picture Association met with our attorneys last night and told them that he won't be a party to anything as un-American as a blacklist. Tell the boys not to worry, he said. There'll never be a blacklist. We're not going to go totalitarian to please this committee. As he confided in his diary, though, he wasn't so sure. We seem to be under constant surveillance. Not a single telephone conversation uninterrupted by strange clickings and voices on the wire. Sauntering figures take nearby chairs and lean back to listen better as we consult with our lawyers. An old Washington hand warns us that microphones bloom everywhere and it would be better to conduct conferences in the park behind the Shoreham Hotel. Dear Barbara, last night, Rossin, Milestone, Cole, Demetri, Collins, and I went to dinner at the famous Harvey's restaurant. And who do you suppose we saw coming out? None other than the great G-Man himself, J. Edgar Hoover. You won't have to remind me to tell you something very interesting about him. Getting terribly sleepy, darling. I'll write again tomorrow. Meanwhile, keep well and give my two fine boys a great big hug and kiss for me and tell them that I love them. Gordon. The following Monday, the committee started calling the unfriendly 19. Uh, Mr. Scott, uh, uh, could you tell the committee whether or not you are now or have ever been a member of the Communist Party? Mr. Stripling, that question is designed to inquire into my personal and private life. I don't think it is pertinent to this uh, I don't think it's a proper question either. Do you have time to answer the question, Mr. Scott? I believe that question also invades my right as a citizen. I believe it also invades the First Amendment. I believe that I should not engage in any conspiracy with you to invade the First Amendment. Uh, Mr. Malt, are you a member of the Communist Party? Next, you are going to ask what my religious beliefs are, and you are going to insist before various members of the industry that since you don't like my religious beliefs, I should not work in that industry. Uh, Mr. Malt. Any such question is quite irrelevant to the course of this committee's investigation. Uh, Mr. Malt, I repeat the question. Are you now, or have you ever been a Each member Each was asked of the if he belonged to the Communist I Party. I the question, Mr. Quisling. I are you a sorry. member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the That's basic principles the of American. Each refused to answer. It is perfectly clear to me, gentlemen, that if you continue in this now, particular Mr. fashion, Will you, direct the you have only one answer the question. And that is to call the strike in the industry. For refusing to cooperate, each was held in contempt. I've seen the newsreels of those confrontations many times. There in the background, in his monocle and goatee, watching the guard drag one of the 19 away is my father, his face expressionless, waiting his turn to testify. It never came. Criticism of the committee's methods had built rapidly in the press, and the chairman unexpectedly called a halt after confronting only 10 of the 19. It is clear the motion picture industry suffers from the presence within its ranks of known communists. 10 were brought before us. There are many more to be heard. It is not necessary for the chair to emphasize the harm which the motion picture industry suffers from the presence within its ranks of known communists who do not have the best interests of the United States at heart. The industry should set out immediately to clean its own house and not wait for public opinion to force it to do so. The hearings are temporarily adjourned. After all the charges and countercharges of treason, people were frightened on both sides of the fence. The American people are about to have to choose between the Bill of Rights and the Commerce Committee. They cannot have the non Italian Activities Committee subpoena Galileo and un French Activities Committee subpoena Joan of Arc. Who are they really after? It is you. It is you. It is you. A few weeks later, 
Just before Thanksgiving, the industry's top executives met secretly in New York and, despite Eric Johnston's promise, agreed to blacklist the 10. We will forthwith discharge or suspend without compensation those in our employ, and we will not re-employ any of the 10 until such time as he is acquitted or has purged himself of contempt and declares under oath that he is not a communist. We will not knowingly employ a communist or a member of any party or group which advocates the overall of the United States by force or by any other laws. The same day, by an overwhelming majority, Congress voted to hold the Hollywood Ten in contempt. If found guilty in federal court, the Ten could face up to a thousand dollars in fines and a year in jail. We identify the communists of this country for the foreign agents that they actually. <laughs> And now we take you to Hollywood for the voice of the world-famous novelist, Thomas Mann. This is Thomas Mann. It was one of the most dizzying retreats in the history of American industry. The film industry became the first mass employer to adopt the blacklist against persons whose political beliefs may not coincide with the prevailing orthodoxies. Other industries may have their blacklists too, in pale ink, oral directives, or in code on executives' desks. But the motion picture business is the first to declare it openly. To help raise money for the Ten's court battle, my father went to work on a book called Hollywood on Trial. Thomas Mann, the Nobel Prize winning novelist, wrote the foreword. Spiritual intolerance, political inquisition, and declining legal security. And all this in the name of an alleged state of emergency. That's how it started in Germany. What followed was fascism, and what followed fascism was war. Every care will be taken to avoid a possible witch hunt, Johnston promised, and there will be a sharp determination to protect liberals from being branded as communists. But none of these dangers or risks will cause a change of mind. Hello? Officially, only the 10 who testified were blacklisted. As one of the 19 who'd been called, though, my father had been cut off, too. After 20 years as a screenwriter, no one was calling him with work. There's no point asking why, Gordon, because they're not going to tell us. Metro, RKO, 20th century, they're running as fast as they can from anyone they even think is communist. But the... I, to I told you, you should have thrown more parties like Sam Spiegel does. He invited everybody. Wait, 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 the studios wait. denied there was anything as concrete and illegal as a formal agreement to keep people from a job. As studio head Jack Warner said, there ain't no blacklist. We use telephones. They Maybe I can get you 250, but they can't know it's you. Just do what you can, okay? Do what you can. <laughs> that Thanksgiving, the first I remember, my parents threw a big party at our home in Beverly Hills. Gordon and Mother had bought the house before I was born a 13-room celebration of his rising income and prospects as a screenwriter, done in the Spanish style, with four bathrooms, a huge dining room with a Chinese rug, a large kitchen with an adjoining breakfast area, a butler's pantry, five bedrooms, a backyard with a towering eucalyptus tree, a three-car garage, and an enormous living room with a white grand piano. Some of the Hollywood Ten were there. He offers me a third of what I usually get. Nothing personal, he says, but I gotta pay for the front. Such principles he's passed this half to sir. One of the 19, a rising leading man named Larry Parks, was there too, fresh from a box office success in the Al Jolson story. And Margaret O'Brien, the child star from The Secret Garden, and Meet Me in St. Louis, who ran through the house laughing and hiding with my brother Jim. Hopes were high. The 10 were ready to go all the way to the Supreme Court. 
where a liberal majority was sure to reverse the contempt citations and roll back the blacklist. Ten people we knew had been indicted for contempt because of what they believed. If that could happen, anything could happen. But we didn't let ourselves get frightened. Not if the Constitution meant what it said. Not yet. Mr. Chairman, I want to read you some of these names of the people from Hollywood who criticized the committee. Danny Kaye, his real name, David Daniel Kamirsky, Edward Robinson, his real name is Emmanuel Golden. But by Christmas, even the stars had fallen silent. Oh, there's another, another here who calls himself Melvin Douglas. No name was big enough to stand up to the committee Melvin and its friends. Kesselberg. How can a man as smart as you get in so deep, Gordon? You'll lose everything. Let it blow over. That's precisely what they want. You used to have a lot more given you. And I'm not putting it back in to bend over and kiss anyone's ass. On my father's last day at the studio, he ran into his oldest friend in Hollywood. It's the people who count, Sam. And not the Dory Sherry's or all the cowards and ass kisses in Beverly Hills. Jesus Christ. Dear Mr. Hoover, I saw Gordon Kahn when he came to clear out his office and we got into an argument. I asked him how the two of us had drifted so far apart politically after being such close friends for 20 years. He replied that he felt keenly there should be equality for all people and he intended to fight for this ideal. I asked Gordon why didn't he work for this ideal without taking orders from a foreign nation. He replied, that he would take orders from anyone in whom he believed. What are we going to tell the children? How do you explain it to a kid? What I remember most from those days was the silence advancing through our house, tightening the corners of my mother's mouth, smothering conversations as soon as I entered the room. People are afraid to be seen with their closest friends. Where will it end? I was only four years old, but from what I could gather, something was very wrong with us, and I had no idea what it was or how to make it go away. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Let's get it over here. Please, please be careful. Early that new year, some workmen in brown overalls came to the house, picked up the big white piano Gently. from our huge living room and carried it away. Not long after, other strangers came for lamps, rugs, tables, chairs, and the wonderful curly maple dining room set Mother loved. Nobody told me, but the money was gone, and we were selling everything we didn't need. The living room had gotten so empty you could hear an echo. The rumors, Gordon. They're coming back. So-and-so's talking to the committee. So-and-so's going to be called. My God, it's getting so you don't know what to believe. I'm getting scared. I'd help you if I could, Gordon, but you know how it is. I shouldn't even be talking to you over the phone. Where's the money going to come from, Gordon? I have always stood by my friends. Do you always have to pick up the tab? Tony! That fall, my father sold the house. The word was out he was in trouble with the committee. And even though it was a Beverly Hills address, he got only what he'd paid for at 11 years before. Still, it was enough to get us a smaller place over the hills in Studio City. Tony, we're leaving. And to buy himself some time to work on Hollywood on trial. I was relieved to be going. Nobody in Beverly Hills seemed to want to play with me anymore. No, she can't come out today. She's not at home. The little girl next door didn't even want to say goodbye. Office of the Director, FBI. 
Special agents reported a car registered in the name of Gordon Kahn leaving 603 North Hillcrest, Beverly Hills. A pretext call to the house indicates it is for sale and that Kahn is moving to 3780 Mound View Avenue, Studio City. My father had always written quickly and on a deadline. The deadline for Hollywood on trial was the tightest of his life. If the book didn't help rally public opinion and keep the 10 out of jail, the committee would pick up where it left off, with him. Good night, dear. Try to get some rest. Good night. I loved the new house. The rooms were much closer than in Beverly Hills, and I'd drift off every night with the sounds of my family wrapped around me like a blanket. My older brother breathing slowly in the adjoining bed, my aunt having one last cigarette in the kitchen, my mother unpacking our things in the new den and limping slightly on the bare wood floor. She had a problem with her hip, and I'd heard she might have to go back east soon for an operation. Only one thing troubled me. The man behind the door in my dreams had come back. Just before we'd left Beverly Hills, I'd heard his voice in the echoing rooms and darkened hallways of our house, wondering where we were going and calling my name. Somehow, he'd found us again, and I didn't know what to do. If I spoke of him to anyone, he'd kill me. If my family saw me with him, he'd kill them. Blacklisted, Episode 1, Hollywood on Trial, was performed by Ron Liebman as Gordon Kahn, Stockard Channing as Barbara Kahn, Carol O'Connor as J. Edgar Hoover, and Tony Kahn as the narrator. The cast also featured Julie Harris, Eli Wallach, John Randolph, Jerry Stiller, Martin Mull, Constance McCashin, Julie Halston, Patricia Bosworth, Susan Stamberg, Ira Wood, Lainey Zira, Jerry Kissel, Will LeBeau, Richard Snee, Sonny Dufo. Your announcer is Will Lyman. Blacklisted was produced, written, and directed by Tony Khan. Co-producer for Blacklisted is Harriet Rison. Associate producers are Sonny Dufo, Spencer Weisbroth, and Eileen Silverstone. Chief engineer is Kevin McLaughlin. Original music was composed and performed by Bill Bookheim. Major funding for this program came from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, with additional support from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities, and the Threshold Foundation, and with production help from KCRW Santa Monica and WBUR Boston. Blacklisted is a production of Tony Khan Productions, which is solely responsible for its content. This podcast of Blacklisted is sponsored by Audible.com, where you can download over 40,000 audiobooks, magazines, radio shows, and more. To download a free audiobook today, go to Audible.com.